Hello and thank you very much for the invite to today's Medcoms networking event. My name's Jane Packham and I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry for the last 25 years. But I think of particular relevance for this session is I've spent a long time working in the arena of medical information. During that, I spent a lot of time not only talking to patients um, and the public, but also writing to them in terms of their inquiries and responses. So I'm really, really passionate about clear communication um, to patients. But I'm also a bit of a pedant. I was down my local restaurant the other day, and the menu sounded great, but I don't know whether you also look at this and go, oh, my word, whether it just makes your toes curl. Um, I'm sorry, apostrophes, capital letters and things. And so it's a love-hate, I think, being a medical writer because these things leap out at you at the page, really. But what I would like to do is um, give you a few tips along the way. I'm a believer that writing is a true challenge. I also believe that it's really easy just to write rubbish, to put it simply. Put it down, um, don't worry about the order, and just let them figure it out. You know, you've done your bit. And I love this quote from a former US president, I shan't name who, but who said that if you can't convince them, confuse them. And sometimes when I look at patient materials that arrive through my letterbox, I think, what are they trying to say? But I really do think that what is much, much harder is to make writing clear concise and understandable. And by understandable, I'm talking understandable on the first read, not leaving them to unpick the details and try and make sense of it. So with my passion for an interest in writing, I took on a personal challenge. And if you've come across the Plain English campaign, they are real champions within the UK, all about clear communication. And I decided in a weak moment to undertake their diploma in plain English. I thought to myself, I know how to write. This will be a doddle, no problem. But actually, I learned so much um, from it. And the big thing that I learned is that I knew that writing is a true skill. But I actually now think that writing for patients is just an amazing skill that you should never, ever underestimate. Writing a document, if it takes you 10 minutes for a healthcare professional, if it then takes you an hour for the patient, I think you're probably spot on because each word has to be handcrafted along the way. So in this session, I'm going to give you a quick refresher of some key writing skills, but also give you a few top tips which you might be doing or maybe just bringing them back into the forefront of your mind that you might want to think about when you're actually writing. I think the real starting point is before you ever start to write, it sounds obvious, but have a plan. It's very, very easy just to start writing, put something down in Word, off we go and things. But I think your starting point is to think about what is it that you need to communicate. But it's even more than that because it's really, it's about the reader. It's not about you as the writer, it's about them. So what is it that they want to know? And if you've not got a clear brief from whoever's asked you to do the writing, then I would actually say, go back and get that, because that has to be the, the starting point. And what I see a lot in, in patient and just general writing is that it's very easy to get carried away. Maybe we're writing in an area where we've had to do some personal research, and so we go, oh, that's really interesting. And so what we tend to do is include information, which I glance as, so what? It's of no relevance to them. They, as an expert patient, will know it already. So at times you need to be brutal and just take it out and again, come back to that point as to what do they want to do. The other thing that I most strongly um, suggest that you do is that when you're thinking about what am I trying to get across, is to always think to put the most important information first. So if there is something that they need to do, a call to action, they need to complete a form or go to a website or register, something like that. Always put that right at the beginning because we're all human. If we are faced with even a page document, two pages, if it's beyond, do we genuinely read all the way to the end? We probably don't. People don't read that information in this day and age. They dot about. So if there's something that they need to do, it needs to shout from the, from, from the get-go. And that is why some sort of executive summary approach can actually be really, really helpful. 
if I think back to medicines, if we think about patient information leaflets, I think that is why we always have an index. You know, section one is about this, section two is about that. So it acts as signposts to allow the reader to get to the bit that they want to read rather than having to laboriously go through all the information and probably give up along the way. Another thing which I think is really critical when you're writing for patients and the public is to keep it personal. This example at the top, um, more information can be provided by the prescribing healthcare professional. Where, hey, how exciting is that? But does man on the street actually understand that? Does that feel personal, friendly, engaging? I don't personally think so. So we could switch that into something like if you need more information, please ask your doctor, nurse or pharmacist. We within the pharmaceutical industry may often talk about healthcare professionals, but probably if you've stopped somebody walking down the high street and say, well, what does that mean to you? They probably wouldn't know. So it's about translating our sort of jargon that we use into terms that really will be understandable to, to man on the street. The other thing which I think is really, really key is to chop your sentences, keep them short. I always say to people, fall in love with the full stop. It's easy to write long, verbose sentences with clauses, subclauses along the way. But you know what? It's much, much easier to understand, you know, a short sentence, maybe 15 to 20 words, something like that. And so if you're finding that you are writing a letter and you start with, I am writing, it's like, well, yeah, I know, I've got the letter in front of me. So just be brutal, chop it out. And it may be that this is a, a, a two-phase process, draft something and then go back and reflect on what you've written, but be brutal. But not too brutal, where you've chopped out so much that actually you become rude and a bit aggressive in your writing. It's a bit of a fine balance, but keep that, you know, that friendly style as you go along. Jargon, I would say, is probably one of my biggest bugbears and one of the major things that I constantly see. We live in a highly technical medical writing environment. But we constantly have to bear in mind that that is not the case for the vast majority of people who are going to be write, reading our information. The average UK reading age um, is that of a 9 to 12 year old child. So you've got to pitch up more the, the sun reader, the tabloid reader. And so if in our writing we're talking about pharmacovigilance, healthcare professional, adverse event even, or if we're talking about the, you know, the lovely black triangles and talking about additional monitoring, then put yourself in their shoes. Are they really going to understand those terms? Probably they're not. So you need to constantly be thinking about how can we translate that. Pharmacovigilance, you might be talking about drug safety. Healthcare professional, that would be your nurse, your doctor, your pharmacist. Adverse event, it's probably just a side effect. That's what most people understand. And black triangle, additional monitoring, hmm, yes. I think you've got to go back and try and explain that if they get any side effect, then they need to contact the company or maybe the, the lovely yellow card reporting scheme. And so expand it by adding more, more words. But a slight caution there is that We've got to always remember that what we're trying to do is make it understandable, but we don't want to dumb down our writing to such an extent that we've actually become patronising and a bit insulting. So you've got to think about who is your reader. If you are writing for an expert group of patients or the public, then they may well understand all this complicated terminology. So just keep that in mind, and it may be that you've got to adapt your style you know, to, to meet the specific target audience that you're writing for. Another thing that I often see is about using correct and also consistent terminology. And my tip for you here would be to think about using sort of everyday, almost conversational words in your writing. And if you've got the luxury, go and talk to some patients who have got maybe the disease, the condition, and see what terms they're using and follow them. But if you haven't got access to them, and we don't always, then maybe have a look at some medicines and look at the patient information leaflets. Because all those have gone through a phase of user testing. So it's gone out and they've been tested on, on real live patients. And they will have picked up on phrasing and to make sure that it's understandable. 
And also, I think another brilliant source of information is to have a look at some of the really great patient websites that are out there. Just a little example for you. Um, a while ago, I was writing some information for people with sight problems. And I thought I didn't want to offend anybody. I wanted to be politically correct in my, my terminology. And I initially thought that, yeah, sight problems, that, that encompasses you know, all those um, you know, different visual problems going on. But then I stopped and thought, hold on, have I got that term right? And for me, I then went on to the RNIB, um, so the, the Royal National Association for, for Blind uh, People. And actually, they use a completely different terminology. And they talk about people who are losing their sight. Or maybe you're blind or partially sighted. I didn't want to offend anybody by talking about, you know, if you're blind, I thought, oh, no, shy away from that. And so that really helped me to make sure that I've got appropriate terminology by, you know, looking and seeing what are the big associations, what terminology are they they're using. So that might be a, a great way um, to find, you know, correct terms. And then, as I said, you need to be consistent. It's very, very easy to start off and you're talking about blind people, but then halfway through your writing, you then switch across to sight problems, which you know, could be really confusing for the reader. So I'd say pick your term and stick with it and make sure that that is repeated you know, during the, the material that you're writing. Another important thing when you're writing materials for, for anyone, really, but I think it's particularly critical for, for patients, is that the layout is super critical. And as I've said before, we can't assume that they are going to start at the top and go all the way down to the bottom and read every single word. So what I've done is giving you a couple of examples to show how I've changed the layout hopefully, to make it you know, a bit more attractive. Now, I've purposefully blurred out the, the, the wording because I don't want you to be distracted, but I hope the sentiment comes across. So if you were greeted by something like this, this was some technical um, writing that I did, um, lots of p-values, results, and this type of thing, you might be looking at that and thinking, oh my word, it looks very, very text heavy. It looks a bit dull on the page, not sort of that engaging um, for anyone really. But then what I try to do is to change the format of it. And so hopefully the key points that you can see here is that towards the top there, I've incorporated some bullet points. And what that's done, it's changed the whole of the top area of that section and has incorporated white space. White space, as the name suggests, is purely blank area on the page. And this is really, really important in terms of conveying and making it more understandable. Headings are great because they act as signposts and again incorporate more um, white space on the page. And it's very much about keeping fairly short paragraphs along the way and thinking about including that information in maybe tables, maybe graphically as well, because the eye is automatically drawn to that and it's a brilliant way of relaying information um, clearly and concisely. The other thing that you might be tempted to do, particularly for patients, is to think, right, we're going to put some visuals in. Let's get some trendy um, infographics along the way, some little um, icons and things. But that's all well and good, but I just caution you very, very slightly on that. This was one that was incorporated into an old-fashioned patient information leaflet. And so this was before the days of user testing. And they had this lovely little symbol there, which some people say to me, well, it looks like a coin with a question mark. Some people say, oh, yeah, definitely a tablet. And some people go, actually, we've not a clue what that depicts. And actually, what they said it depicted, the proper heading was, what is it used for? So this section was meant to clearly say to patients, look for that and it will tell you the indications for a medicine. But you might well be looking there and scratching your head going, no, I would not associate that image with that heading. So it just reminds us, I think, along the way that if you're going to choose an image, then pick one that people will truly recognise along the way. Interesting, just as a little sideline now, when you look at most modern-day user-tested patient information leaflets, there are now very, very few graphics, unless it's more of an injection device where they're explaining how to put the needle on, to press the button, because actually they found that they were really confusing patients along the way. So be mindful of that if you're you know, going down the route of images. Also think about formatting. 
the Plain English campaign, and they have a great website and they've got help information on there, um, are very, very um, passionate about three things in particular. Putting lots of text in capitals. You've got a big heading, you want to make it stand out, so you put it in block capitals. But actually, this is amazingly aggressive. And it takes somebody a lot longer to read block text than having sort of the, the up and down um, of, of a normal upper and lower case. They're not keen on italics. They're really not. And I've just done this in Lucinda call calligraphy to try and demonstrate it. If you're trying to speed read, it slows you down. So avoid that if you can possibly. And the last one that they show, um, you know, they comment on is underlining. And I know some people are really hooked on underlining, so it's a major change to try and get away from this. But I've just taken the, the classic um, typing sentence, which shows every character of the alphabet. And what I want you to do is focus on the Q, the J of jumps, and then the, the Y in the, the word lazy. Because you'll see that depending where the underlining falls within the font, it cuts through the tails. And so again, if you're trying to speed read, that quick, the Q, actually looks more like a letter A, so it will slow us down. The lazy, that Y is turned into a V. And so again, we just have to think a little harder to be able to read that text. So as a consequence, plain English campaign, and it's one that I've adopted, will say, don't underline. It's particularly critical for websites because that also still signifies a hyperlink. So if you've got underlined text, you'll find users are trying to click on it. Of course, they then don't go anywhere. Final point just to, to flag. We started off with that lovely menu with the capital letters and the, uh, the apostrophe is correct. Of course, what is so important is always proof for your, your work. I'm probably preaching to the converted here. But however you do it, don't just rely on a spell checker, um, an O2 APC. If you got every single word there misspelt, oh, apart from the letter A, that would perfectly go through a spell checker. But of course, the, the description at the bottom is absolutely gobbledygook. So don't just rely on that. And if you make mistakes with, with typos and things, you'll soon find that the reader actually starts to mistrust your information. They might tolerate one, but beyond that, they'll go, mm -mm, we're not happy with this, and they'll discredit it. So that gives you a few of my key tips and uh, thoughts along the way. If you are thinking, oh, this sounds very interesting, I would like to know more, then I run sort of bespoke in-house training on a lot of aspects of both medical writing, but also patient writing as well, and also undertake some writing projects along the way. If you'd like to know more, there's my website there, there's my email, so please do get in touch. So many thanks.